Facebook. It is Sunday. What date is it? It is the 26th. I don't know how that happened. I think I say that every time. I'm Heron Michelle. Welcome to another Witch on Fireside chat here from my home during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic shelter in place uh, crisis that's been going on everywhere. Um, I own a metaphysical witchcraft store in downtown Greenville, North Carolina called the Sojourner Whole Earth Provisions. And um, it's been closed or it's now on curbside pickup. So while we've been um, suffering that, I've been doing these videos to try to just be connected with everybody. And I'm so pleased to see when people jump on to the chat. It makes me very happy. Hey, Melissa. Nice to see you back. Um, I've got some fun things planned for this Sunday. Oh, among them, I thought I would uh, just share one little witch hack I have uh, when I make my loose incense. Hey, Jenny! Welcome to our play date. We were chatting earlier and I said, I feel like I've got a play date. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wanted to make some more of my water incense because I've been trying to get the all four of my elemental blends ready to, to maybe sell as a set because I know that um, Heather has been driving me crazy. One of our viewers and students has been driving me crazy to put together a set she could buy. And I've got plenty of fire and air, but I was out of water and earth. So I started to blend some and then I thought, well, I could demonstrate one of these um, little tricks I've got and and maybe that'd be fun. And then also, um, per Jenny's request, we're going to talk about, um, uh, I'll call it, where do you go next? after the gates of initiation and the great work of magic and some ideas for how you could um, dedicate a, a witchcraft practice year after year uh, according to the cycles of the wheel of the year. And another thing, if we get to it, that I've been thinking about because I've been writing about it a lot lately, is the concept of power and how Jung defined the stages of power in relation to um, how one internalizes the loci of control, security, and authority that are required for mature adulthood. Hey everybody! Hey Kayla! Uh, so, I've been writing a lot today. I have to admit that I'm in a bit of a a brain fog. Actually, I've been just sort of sitting at my computer for like 12, 14 hours straight for a couple of days in a row. And my voice even feels froggy like I haven't used it enough lately. Cheers! Okay, so incense. I think it is super easy to make a magical incense blend. And um, if you do a loose one, then it doesn't really need special things like um, necessarily like, you know, the kind of binders that would keep it in a, a stick or a cone shape. Uh, you don't have to have burning agents in there. You are required to burn it on a charcoal tab. For example, I'll just spill it. I think you can see it if I do this. I'll tilt this down a little bit. For example, a cauldron with some sand and a hookah charcoal tab. We'll burn on there in a minute. Anyway, if you make your own loose incense, you can basically put any plant material that you want into it. Oh good, Alan. Cheers to all y'all at home with your full chalices, red wine and granny's chalice tonight. You'll have to forgive me. I got some wicked squirrel brain. Again, this is not an unusual thing for me. Anyway, okay, so I wrote an article a long time ago called Magical Herbalism Like You Really Mean It. And it's the just a, a magical method of blending uh, loose incense together in an empowered way. And I make mine in advance, obviously, you know, when the moon is right or whatever. This is my jar of elemental water incense that I keep here at the house when I need more or it's time to fill some more little containers to take them down to the store to sell. Um, I basically, you know, just craft up some more and I blend it in with what I've already had. I don't have to start fresh every time. It's kind of like one of those friendship starter breads, you know, you you always have the, the mother or whatever, the 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 starter bit and then you just add in from there and even if I change up my ingredients I just lit the sort of 
I don't know, the spunk of the old one just transfer into the new one. And anyway, in my elemental water incense, um, the little card that I provide with the batch that I made previously, um, it's all blended according to astrological moon and planetary magic of moon for my water incense. Um, elemental undine um, can be called as well as the, the Sovereign Nixa um, via this uh, incense. It is blended for that purpose and attuned to that. So the uh, powers that it could lend tend to be daring or acceptance. Those are the powers of water. Um, anything regarding the emotions, love, relationships, intuition, and healing. Um, because of the moon and the water association, psychism could be really good too. Yeah, it's like making kombucha. To me, it is anyway. Same thing with my um, with my magical mortar and pestle. I mean, I'll scrape out the bits as best I can, but I don't go scrub that down. I mean, and I don't even really care what was in there last. I only make magical things in here. I don't ever eat out of it, so it doesn't really matter to me. I just let the magic carry over. You know what I mean? Is that just me? Hey, Misty Sue. Pleasure to have you here. So anyway, in my water incense, what I normally put in there is white willow bark. Well, let me, let me repeat. From the first time we, uh, the video when I talked about this. And my, the recipes that I do, and I'm pretty sure I picked this up from maybe the Scott Cunningham book. The Complete Book of Incense Oils and Brews. He gives instructions there. It's hard to say. Good. Okay, Alan does the same thing with her mortar and pestle. That's good. Oh yeah, magical tools. We had not talked about this. For those who may not know, mortar, pestle. Mortar, pestle, for the grinding up of larger things into smaller bits, usually plants. Always keep a separate mortar and pestle for culinary and healing and, you know, things you'll ingest, please. Because there are some things you might use for magical purposes that are not to be ingest, ingested and there is uh, you just do not need to be worried about did you get that clean enough. Just don't. It is, it is well worth your time to keep not only the preparation space and those um, non-edible ingredients and the equipment used to deal with them in a separate place, but you know, it's just so much easier and so much safer to do that. So I got another whole rig for, you know, food stuff in the kitchen. Hey y'all, I'm so excited to have everybody here. All 12 of us, it's a party. All right, one more. To you, Jennifer, welcome. Mm. Okay, so magical herbalism, like you really mean it to me, would be to say to make everything about this a ritual. And I didn't prepare all that. But you've seen me do it. Whenever we, I do magic, I don't just chuck stuff in like, blur, blur, like you just nameless ingredient. I try to awaken and um, interact with the consciousness within each ingredient. And I do try to make the thing a ritual. Like, for example, if I were going all out right now, for one... And this is what makes this a little hinky. If I were being ideal, I would have done this, you know, when the moon was in a water sign or something like that. And I'm pretty sure that's not the case right now. I'm pretty sure we're in Gemini. So here we go. But I'm making incense and incense associated with air. So maybe. Anyway, I've already sort of begun on my incense because I wasn't going to do the whole dog and pony show. I just really wanted to show you one of my tricks. So like I said, my incense ratio, my God, I'm squirrel brain. Back to the zag and zig. Hey, Rhonda Lee. My ratio on loose incense, I like to do one to one to one, a wood powder, a resin, tree resin, and then another one third part of that in variety of other um, plant material, herbs, flowers, leaves, roots, other things. I do like to add a little bit of essential oil to my incense blends. It just gives it a boost. That is not um, strictly necessary. It, it is, does make it more expensive. If you happen to have them around, you might as well, in my opinion. Now, the other thing is I tend to um, have a lot of that around, but I am in the business. And sometimes a bottle will get kind of old and it'll just get a little thick and and there might be you know just a little bit more I don't know it just it just 
the oils, they seem to be a little thicker and a little less easy to work with. If that's the case, I save them and I put them in an incense because to burn them, the scent to me is still good, even if it might not be as, um, I don't know, fresh as it once was. So that's how I, I do that. I, I, I tend to keep the older ones around for incense purposes. So my recipe here is um, a special blend, which, you know, kind of depends on my intuition each time. Um, the wood is a white willow bark associated with the moon. Benzoin resin and myrrh are associated with uh, water. And so I do a blend of them. Um, then I like to add, uh, according to my intuitions, uh, the flowers of jasmine, chamomile. I like to add some thyme. Um, and then eucalyptus and lemon peel are really the main things. So the other day when I was at the store, I pulled together in a baggie, you know, most of it. And, uh, you know, just a, a combination of things. I just um, added them together just to get them home in a bag, frankly. But what I didn't have was lemon peel. And that got me thinking. So you said the store were out. But this is what it looks like when it comes dried. And that's convenient for sure. But you don't have to use store-bought citrus peel by any means. And if you're a mom or do you just like fruit, I don't know. There was a while there where I had so many of those cuties, little tangerines sitting around, you know, and we just always have fruit in the bowl. So every time I would peel something citrus, like a tangerine or an orange or whatever, I just keep the peels and then I can um, dry them in my dehydrator and then powder them in like a, a my coffee bean grinder. <laughs> I have a coffee bean grinder for that. But it's really best if you're just doing it for magical purposes. For example, Lemon is what I want for water, but you can also use um, the oranges for sun. I really want to try lime, but right this minute I don't know even which which element that associates with. If anybody happens to know if there's a particular planet or element associated with lime, I would love to know because I'm going to experiment with that soon. But all you have to do to, to do this is either use a, um, a vegetable peeler and just really carefully um, pull off the outside bit, you know, just the green bit. You don't want a lot of the pulp. Oops, that just went right out my face. You just sort of take it off, right, in little, little strips. I like to use a vegetable peeler. It's much easier. And then once you've got that, I would just put it on the like a, a chopping board and do a really fine dice of it. It doesn't take a special uh, dehydrator necessarily. I just leave it on a paper towel out on the counter and usually overnight it's dry enough for, for my purposes. And then like I said, I can either um, put it, the little tiny chunks of straight in the incense or I can um, grind it up in a coffee bean grinder and make a powder out of it. I actually can give an example of that if I can see where I put it. I did um, a great incense one time using tangerine and it really was just the tangerines at my house that my kids were eating. Uh, I can't see it right now. Oh, yeah, I can. I'll be right back. I'll go grab it. Right here. Just powder tangerine peel. Mmm, smells like liquid sunshine. Or powder tang, actually. Now that I think about it, that's what that smells like. So, anyway... Just a little hack there if you're, you know, you don't have, like I said, another thing you can just get around the house that you don't have to have down at the metaphysical store. But it sure does make it easy when you can. So, I'll just put that aside. Oh, and that way we can concentrate on this. So, I have, um, in my mortar and pestle, I just want to grind up a little bit of the lemon peel. So, just as an example, what I might do... is add the peel to my mortar and pestle. I think I'm gonna do three of these because I want a fair amount. Nah, I need a little more. I like to add things to junkier bits first. Awaken powers of lemon to your powers of water. And through your lemony, watery essence, invoke that elemental power, call Undine, call Nexta to be present in any right. Awaken, awaken, awaken to your power. 
So your mortar and pestle just takes elbow grease. It's, it's uh, energy and power directed into it. I want to just bruise it a little bit at this point. I don't really need it to be a fine powder. But I do like to put some energy on it, awakening it with the mortar and pestle. Okay, chunkier things first. And I did want to add a little bit of chamomile also. Chamomile um, flowers are amazing, delicious, beautiful, and these happen to have been donated to me by someone um, affiliated with the shop who happens to just have a lot of flowers and didn't know what to do with them and asked if I wanted them one day. And so we did a little exchange for some things I had there that he wanted and it was very nice. I'm gonna bruise those up too. Awaken powers of chamomile and your delicious honey scent. And your powers of water evocation. All right, simple enough. I'm going to add all this to my jar and then I'm going to show you all a trick. I like to do the oils and the glycerin directly in the jar and I'm hoping that you guys can see it if I hold it up properly. Add that. Awaken powers of white willow, benzoin and myrrh, jasmine and thyme, eucalyptus. Awaken to your watery power. Welcome. Hey, Lynn, welcome. All right, we'll stir a little bit first. Now, the thing here is that it's very dusty, right? You see the dust rising out of it? I'm incorporating it now with what was there already. Now this is the trick, and I got this out of that Timothy Roderick Wicca Year in a Day book, and I've always liked it. It's Like I said, it's not really necessary. It may be just to some an extra hassle, but what I like to do is add vegetable glycerin. It doesn't smell like anything, and it doesn't do anything, really. We'll put a couple tablespoons in there. It doesn't do much to the... Like I said, the, the scent profile at all. But the more you blend it, the less dusty it gets. And it binds everything and makes it a little bit more cohesive. And you just got to do a little bit at a time, kind of just mashing it from the edges. I'm also now going to add a little bit of essential oil. The ones that I like to use for this are lemon and eucalyptus again. Those are the scents I like to highlight. So I'm going to add nine for the moon. Nine drops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's probably more than nine drops, but nine squirts, dashes. Same here with the eucalyptus. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, I'm going to add a little more of this. I don't know. I just like it much better, and it has a much more cohesive, less dusty, more together quality. I'll keep working on that while we chat. Yep, churning your, uh, Alan says that uh, her favorite part is churning the intent of the material. Yeah, if you're just chucking these expensive uh, things in a, in a bowl and not really thinking about them as allies, if you're not really working with their consciousness and their spirit, I mean, you're just commodifying them, and that's just kind of asshole behavior as far as I'm concerned. It makes us consumerists and not, um, not really magically empowered, interconnected beings as far as I'm concerned. So I try to be mindful of that and not be wasteful and try to make careful choices. Like for example, you can, you know, I, I use these my, my correspondences book to, to, you know, get ideas for which things are associated, which planets, which elements, what um, their personality, what their consciousness is said to bring to, you know, any working. Oh, I made a mess. And 
I, so I look at that list and those lists are very broad strokes, right? They include things that could grow anywhere. Well, I don't live just anywhere. I live here in Eastern North Carolina and things have different price points and have different sustainability, you know, requirements, different levels of endangerment and so forth. And so if I can pick something just simple and local and easy and cheap and you know whatever it does not cheapen the effectiveness of your blend like I said if you get a recipe out of a grimoire some old European grimoire what made it what made each ingredient special I'm sure to that place and time was its availability there my god I just keep making a mess squirrel anyway okay so much better now so much less dusty can you see here's a it's just so much different now it has such a different quality it's a little darker a little better bound I just smell it very well it without getting a bunch of dust up my nose I don't know I just like it vegetable glycerin so that's that trick Here's the next trick I want to show y'all. I told you this already 10 times. I'm just going to keep demonstrating it, I guess. You can put stone chips in just about anything. That's the mystery. And I like to add, if I can, the allies from all realms. To me, in the middle world here, we've got allies of stone, plant, and bone. And if I can bring in something uh, from animal kingdom also, I will. But anyway, I like to put stones in there. So my stones of choice for water and the moon are rainbow moonstone. And they don't burn, obviously. And you can put the really fine stuff, really tiny little chips. You think, what else am I going to do with that? I'm just going to put a little handful of these chips. See, it continues to charge. Awaken powers of rain, rainbow moonstone to your watery, your watery powers. And this aquamarine aquamarine's on the pricey side right i don't have a whole lot of that laying around but one time i had one of these bracelets and i wore it forever and it broke the string broke and so i just put the the string in this little jar so that when i want it i can pull off a few beads so three aquamarine one two three bring your beautiful watery powers to this party and of course once you're ready you gotta charge it. And people do that different ways. I think the power of the mind is really all we really need to help get us there, but I have some experience with the realms of water, and so I can do that in my mind's eye also. So I imagine the beach, the ocean, the realms of sovereign Nixa, the undine and swimming with them in the ocean, traveling with them as rain and falling upon the earth, to travel by rivers back to the ocean. I remember all that power and all that fluidity, all that daring and all that acceptance. I channel up that energy as blue light. Channel it through my heart, which I see as holding my own waters of emotion and I push that into the jar. Hail and welcome. Hours of water. All right, let's light this charcoal again. I'll show y'all how that goes. Up close and personal. First we light the charcoal tab. This is uh, one of our Swift Light. I think these only cost like $3.50 for a pack of 10. Yeah, it's popping. There we go. I'm gonna let the sparks cross right over it and then we'll add a little and see how it smells. I did make a right proper unholy mess with this thing. Ooh. Oh well. Let's see. So the other thing we wanted to talk about tonight is um, the great work of magic and what one might do beyond one's first year and a day of training and initiation into the craft. I mean typically speaking before anyone decides to self-initiate into witchcraft or 
be initiated in a tradition. As far as I'm concerned, you should at least have studied and turned the wheel of the year for a whole cycle, a whole year. I think it's important to have experienced firsthand and with dedication each Sabbath in each lunar cycle in an intimate way, personal way, while studying, while experiencing, while working on your psychic development, while working on your development of your the development of your um, relationship with spirit and divinity, I think all that needs to be happening for a whole year, and that is traditional. It's based on the um, the mythos of Caridwen's Cauldron, a Celtic myth, about spending time to gain wisdom. I think you need to have make an informed decision before you initiate. All right, here we go. See it? See that nice texture to it? Little bit. Hmm. Mm, I love it. It's an interesting smell. It isn't um isn't it isn't always when you make your own magical incense, it isn't even it isn't always about just the does this make my house smell nice? You think yeah, Rob reminds I do always say witchcraft has to be messy and I have I have made a terrible mess here. I mean, seriously, after I've done anything, I usually feel oily and gritty and smell faintly strange of patchouli and pine and wood smoke and dirt. Anyway, I think it's nice and woodsy. Mm. I don't know. It's uh, it's got it's got a very interesting smell. I think I'll, I think it's the the combination of the eucalyptus and lemon well I wish y'all were here to smell this to me it invokes water if you have a water blend incense you can then use that like I said for psychism for emotional relationship things for healing work anything that would require that, that would be aided by elemental water or the moon it's a double whammy so anyway, we have plenty now. I can jar up and get ready to sell in the packs. I just have to make some more earth. Earth is next. I probably should have started there tonight because we're actually in Taurus. But anyway, so that was the demo. So the things to talk about, you uh, dedicate, you do a year in a day, you do a year. The year is the, you know, cycle all around. My suggestion would be to start at Yule and end at Yule, because that's how the great wor work um, begins and ends for me. Oh, you moved away, Mina? Well, we miss you too, I'm sure. Um, so, to me, the great work starts when we enter Capricorn, the sun enters Capricorn. That's winter solstice, that's Yule. It is the beginning, but it's not like, oh, we're, we're ready to start diving in and doing major action sort of stuff. It's more like the darkness before the dawn, where you look into the future and you just start dreaming about the future. Anyway, once you uh, turn the whole eight Sabbaths and I'll do all 12 to 13 moons and you arrive back around at the other side and you really know something then firsthand, you can make an informed decision. This smoke, wow. You can make an informed decision, right? No blind faith leaping of basins here. Very informed, free will leaping of basins. Then you can self-initiate, but then what do you do, right? So your first dedication to the great work of magic, which is usually spoken ritually at Imult. That's high winter. Um, what then? Well, here's some ideas. You gotta keep learning, right? Every year you make another dedication. In our tradition, you, uh, your day is metaphorical. The day is just the period of pause you use to think about it and prepare. And we have another whole program um, after the dedicant year called our neophyte program. It can take six months to a year. And, um, and that's when people are preparing for their self-initiation. And then we recommend that folks, regardless of when they initiate during that year, because, you know, it could be Shoot, it could be Letha, it could be the moon before Samhain. But that just to give themselves a break and just sort of hold the space for a while until the, the great work kicks off again the next year. So then what do you do? Well, I do not recommend diving directly into second degree 
work. It's not even allowed at the SOJO. Uh, in the SOJO circle, we ask folks to have um, turned two full turnings of the wheel from their first initiation before they, they even start that work again. So what do you do? Well, I recommend working through the elements or um, uh, I would suggest that maybe you you think about what the various uh, skills and aspects of witchcraft work are and then think, oh, there's a there's a, um, an expertise I'd like to s seek in one. For example, maybe you were interested in divination and so you spend a year working with a particular divination tool or trying different divination tools and just really work on psychic development and um, and, and, and the tools of divination for a year. That'd be one. Or perhaps you were interested in the healer aspects and so just spend a whole year working on uh, energy healing or um, uh, herbalism, healing herbalism techniques, crystal healing techniques, that kind of thing. Or maybe you want to do more the with the walker between the worlds, the clairvoyant, shamanic, uh, astral travel, past life retrieval, you know, that kind of um, uh, ability to move um, spiritually through the different realms to, to learn and to retrieve information and to do all sorts of things. So more the, the shamanic work, perhaps. That's your dedication for a year. Um, or maybe it's magic. Maybe you want to study a whole year of planetary magic, and so you work with that. Or I'm going to study astrology, and with astrology, I'm going to, to integrate my practice for a whole year. But whatever it is, pick something, a more narrow field of focus, and then do that. Um, at some point, I think in every witch's career, <laughs> career is a bad word, process, I would recommend dedicating to it um, working with that elemental energy for one year. Now, what does that mean? For example, if you were doing divination work, um, dream work, uh, intuitive development, that could be part of a water year. If you were doing healing work, I could say that very much could be part of um, also water. It could be considered earth, you know, the physical self, if you were working on physical healing. Um, Air would be things of an academic nature. I'd like to study the theology or I'd like to get into the nuts and bolts of an actual alchemy practice. It's kind of like being a chemist. Hey, Ana Maria. Um, and, you know, so a whole year of air, you know, a dedication to elemental air, a great component to that would be studying something very academic or brainy, you know, like I said, theology or an alchemy practice or something um, where you really get deep into the, the nuts and bolts and bones of, the occult why. That'd be a great year of study after, you know, initiation. Fire would be what are you going to do about it? Maybe you need to um, really get yourself motivation, motivated to attack the sacred mission that you're here to do. The year after I self-initiated, the very first time way back, on the advice of my mentor at the time, the priestess who was working with me at the time, I dedicated to a year of working with fire and that was a good idea for me because at the time well in my personal birth chart it's the weakest element and at the time I was very stuck in situations that didn't necessarily serve my highest good but I wasn't particularly um, motivated to to make big changes she thought it would help to to motivate me to get me activated to my sacred mission to you know to create the change that I was looking for in my life. And she was right. It was a very transformative year. Also extremely difficult. Many things happened to basically burn my life to the ground. And then what was I to do but build it up? Now I didn't really know what my sacred mission was supposed to be at the time. I knew I, by that Mabin, I knew I wanted to pursue becoming a priestess in, in um, public group leadership kind of a priestess because I had been invited to lead a public um, Mabin or autumnal equinox uh, ritual, uh, gathered up a group of people that I knew, great witches who had been in various study groups and coffee clutches and proto covens with me. And we executed, I thought, an excellent um, Mabin ritual, you know, like a witch's Thanksgiving with a beautiful feast and a beautiful ritual. And it was very moving and very empowering. 
And at the end of that, I'm like, that, that's, that's the thing. That's the thing I want. And, but by the time I think November rolled around, I already knew that I wanted to open the Sojourner. This was going to be my full-time job. The, and how do I get there? There's got to be a means to the end. Oh, by the way, we also need supplies. I want to be able to have a temple space, a public temple space on Main Street. That became my mission. And so um, by the end of the year, I had already uh, started working on business plans. And um, part of what had happened that year is my mother had passed away. And at some point later on, I got a I got an insurance check because I was her beneficiary. And that provided the means. So you know how when you have that conversation with Spirit and you're like, well, geez, Spirit, if I had the means, sure I would. But, uh, you know, well, you have that conversation with yourself and you're like, well, if, you know, if I win the lottery or the money tree sprouts in the front yard, this is what I do. And that becomes the excuse for why you're not doing it. Oh, well, I don't have a money tree in my yard yet. Well, I'm here to tell you, universe planted a money tree. And what's funny, it's not funny. It is interesting. I don't think there's anything bad about it. But it does sound unusual. So let me tell you the punchline first, and then I'll explain it. In order for there to be a sojourner today, four people had to die. That's the joke. First of all, my mother did die tragically um, of a cerebral hemorrhage caused by an aneurysm no one expected. But that, um, like I said, a little bit of money came my way. The kind of nest egg that you go, huh, maybe I could, uh, maybe I could invest that in a new, a new career, a new way of doing something. And then, um, you know, so I start and then you get going and you realize, oh my God, starting a business costs way more money than you think it's going to. Moreover, a divorce costs way more money than you think it's going to. And about the time where I'm like, this is not going to work, there's not enough to go around, my very, very elderly uh, godfather passed away and I was so surprised to discover that I had been bequeathed 4% of his estate. Mind you, his uh, Christian church got the 50%. I am not complaining. So right when I needed it, um, kind of, you know, despairing, like, oh my God, I need something else to get over the the de you know, the hump here, what are we going to do? Uh, Uncle Collins left me a little bit, which helped me get established in my sovereignty. Time goes on. Um, we start to hit the skids again. Times are hard. I don't know how we're going to pay the bills. I don't know how we're going to pay the rent. I'm like, you know, okay, Cosmos, you said do this and trust you, and then the, the universe would provide. And by God, just as I'm like, look, I've got no more money to invest in the shop to prop it back up. I mean, like personal money into corporate shop. My my grandfather, Saul, elderly, dies peacefully, leaves me some money. Well, leaves my dad money. My dad shunts some down to me. He's like, here, here's a gift from your granddad. Oh, thank you, granddad. We pay. We pay. We're able to, to pay off the debts and prop up the payroll again. Same thing a couple years later. Oh my God, things are hitting the skids. It's really hard times. What are we going to do? I don't know how to pay the bills. Again, my very elderly grandmother who had passed away. Eventually, we were able to sell her house. My uncle very, very nicely, according to my mother's will, pushes some of that money down towards us and it props us up just in the right time. And so I have a long line of very responsible ancestors who, you know, had things like pensions and houses and insurance policies and loved me and had wills and when it all went down that flowed my way just in the right moment i think i just you know continue to remain open in gratitude and trusting of the of the fact that it would work out eventually and um and it did it did the money comes when you when you need it so that was fire for me though. I had to have a little something to kick me in the pants. If you really do want to work with uh, building abundance or building your health or building a business or building a home or building whatever you're building, a year of earth would be a great thing. Very grounding. Um, so, you know, we can do that sort of thing. Here's some other ex uh, examples. You could do um, a dedication solely to one aspect of spirit. Maybe you spend a year working with goddess forms. Maybe, you, uh, you know, really focusing on maybe in accordance to the cycles of the moon, a lunar practice heavily steeped in the goddess or a solar practice heavily steeped in the mythos of the god and you work with god forms for a year. I think that can be especially healing if you have um, come, come to the goddess because you were perhaps wounded by other 
forms of masculine di divinity and wanted a break. And then, you know, maybe you've divorced yourself too much from that side of, of divinity. And so you need to come back to it with fresh eyes and give it another chance. Especially if you um, are of a particular gender. Working with the opposite gender, is a deity, it can be very beneficial to you for at least a little while. Or perhaps you could divide a year up in some way, like the, the waxing half of the year, you know, the light half of the year you work with the god, and the, the waning half of the year you work with the goddess, for example. Or you could think about it in a three worlds model. Maybe one year you're like, I'm going to explore the underworld this year. You know, the chthonic deities, underworld deities, the mysteries of death and rebirth. Maybe another time you're like, this year I'm going to work with upper world deities. Maybe it's, a, it's an angel's year for me. These are ideas. There's so many things. And I would also suggest if you like to work with the tarot, give that a whole year and do the fool's journey. You know, link it up to the cycles of the year. And just march right through it. As a matter of fact, the, the way I've got my, um, my lunar witchcraft book all planned out is uh, following the mysteries of tarot as you go. So... Anyway, that's an idea. I hope that answered your question, Jenny. If you guys have any other ideas or questions, to me, the great work of magic goes on your whole life. It's about your process of evolution. And so there's been whole years where I just ask one theological question, right? Like, for example, um, the year, I guess it was 2014, when I just said, I would like to know what uh, the divinity means when they say unconditional love. And I mean, I got it on an academic way already. I want to know how this applies to people. What does it mean down here among relationships? And that was the year I called on the guidance of goddesses of love, grace, and beauty to, to aid me. And Aphrodite, Venus answered. That was a surprise. Another year I just said, I wanted to, to know about this whole yin-yang balance thing, the balance between receptive and projective mysteries in elemental magic speci specifically. I was really working this concept of the yin-yang and the polarity, the principle of polarity and principle of gender from the Kabbalion, the hermetic principles there. I wanted to really work that and, and, and figure out what that meant. That formed the basis of the book I'm writing right now. I think that was 13 that I did that. There was a year where, oh, another example for you, Jenny. How do you figure out what spirit might be nudging you? It's harder to, it's hard to know what highest divine guidance might have for you. I mean, usually our intuition and synchronicities and our gut and our just interest and, you know, if you follow your intuition long enough, you can trust where it leads you. But for clarification, no matter what's been popping and whirring in the synchronicities for me, I will do tarot every single time. And that first video that I did where I um. I demonstrated my Jewel of Power spread. That is specifically for that purpose of not only what should my next great work be, but if even if you're mid-cycle, okay, where am I at in this discovery? What do I need to know or wonder about? What do I need to will or surrender? What do I need to dare or accept? What do I need to be silent and hold the space on? Or what do I need to resonate, for example? So tarot, or if that's not your, your jam, pull your runes or your staves or your ohm or something. So that's my suggestion there. I hope that helped. All right. This gritty table covered in stuff is killing me. Here, I'll put this up a little bit. All right. So the other thing I was going to talk about is this concept of power. I'm not going to labor on too long about it, but I have been doing a lot of writing on this and studying especially when it comes to Jungian psychology. You know, Carl Jung, the Swiss uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, or, you know, um, early to mid-1900s, an occultist, worked with the tarot, worked with astrology. He really had a, was phenomenal. Um, studied alchemy heavily, or at least he really admired Paracelsus, for example, who was an alchemist, a hermetic philosopher. I think the idea of self-improvement that was so important in alchemy was important to Jung also. So anyway, one of the things in the discussion of how one internalizes their, their sense of control, right, their loci of control or security or authority, um, there was a process there. And in that discussion, and I'll, be, uh, here, I'll give you the, the details here. 
Where is it? Oh yeah, I found a really great article series online written by a woman named Sue Mertens. I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, M-E-H-R-T-E-N-S. And she, uh, she posts a lot of her articles on the UnionCenter.org. And I believe they're, they're based up in New Hampshire. I've actually communicated with her and thanked her for these. But she did a series of articles um, called um, Components of Individuation, two, three, four, Internalizing the Locus of Control, Authority, and Security. And then it started with an article called How to Internalize a Locus of Control. Anyway, a fascinating series. And in there, she um, she speaks, you know, and gives lots of really great uh, references so you can go follow it up in Jung's actual writing. They were talking about stages of power and how one regards power uh, in that sense of um, on whether or not it's they're finding it outside themselves or within themselves. And the search of self, self being the goal, self being like, when we, when, I think when Jung would say, oh, a discovery of self, we would say our spirit, our divine self. And the conflict between that discovery of that divinity and how that clashes with little human ego here is where we get a lot of our, our issues that we have to work through. And so, especially when, when one is trying to establish that sense of self and from where it comes from and, and where does power flow? Where does power come from? Sense of um, personal security and trust in yourself. That it really comes down to how you think about power. Now, to me, power... Oh, it's a combination of understanding your place in the interconnected divine cosmos and understanding or becoming uh, intimately aware of how your spirit body is within that greater spirit and that all you have to do is flex that spiritual muscle. I don't know how to explain that exactly because everybody does it their own way. But we, you do this long enough and you understand how to ping. That's what I call it, the ping. Like I, I can project outward. Uh, at will, because I've practiced doing that, and interconnect with other aspects of spirit and get sensations back. And then I've learned how to trust what that feels like and interpret that in a way. But that takes a long amount of time, tr uh, trial and error, figuring out how this works and being able to trust your intuition on what that means um, based on your experience. So Power to me is, is being in flow with nature. Um, power is um, understanding that weird, weird Anglo-Saxon term that means, you know, our personal destiny. To me, there is this highest divine will of the cosmos. And that is just flowing in the direction of the evolution of that divine being. And it, it is the flow of becoming. And that we're all in it. And we all have our own little thread that we're working, right? And so that's our weird. And we still have free will, but we're still flowing generally in that direction. And so to me, power is when I acknowledge that, I become aware of it, I get in it, and I allow the flow of that process, I flow with it, right? I'm not fighting the stream. I am aware of the direction that it is moving. And then like a good sailor, for example, who understands how the tide works and how currents work and how wind works and how stars work can put all that together to get himself where he needs to go in a sailboat he's allowing those currents and, and and he's putting them to his good use right and so it then it becomes rather effortless if you know how it works and you know how to direct it to your will to go where you want to go that's power to me but you have to really internalize that remember in the charge of the goddess she says that which you seek you find not within you will never find it without gather round, witches, and to you who are fain to learn all sorcery, I will teach the secrets. And that's it. She is that which is, she's been with you from the beginning, and she is that which is attained at the end of desire. That's basically the power, to me, natural power. Okay, so, stages of power and how one rec uh, recognizes. I'm just going to go straight off my notes from this, the article on the um, Carl Jung's ideas here. So the lowest one it's called powerlessness. And that's basically a small child, right? A baby. No measure of control. What's an infant going to do, right? 
Two, power by association. You, you feel power through close ties to someone else in power. So for example, you might feel relatively powerful because you're affiliated with your parents at first and you see your parents as powerful and so if you need um, to exert some power in the world, maybe you can go to your parents and they can help you or they'll advocate for you or something like that. Or even if you're an adult and you, don't, you've, you may only acknowledge power because of who your daddy is or who your mama is and you're just going to ride their coattails. Or I'm powerful because I'm the secretary to the Pope. Or I'm powerful because I'm, I don't know, I sit on the board of whatever. But the idea here, maybe they do have personal power, but the idea here is not that their power comes from within themselves. It is still an external affiliation. And you know how people get fired. Um, people die. And so if your sense of power comes from an affiliation with someone or something else, it can go away. And then where would you be left? So that's not ideal. The third one was power by symbols. And I think this, and Jung said this, this is where basically everybody in America, not everybody, capitalism, generally what we think of as power in America, that's it's rooted here. So maybe you feel like you've got power because you've got the corner office or you have a private jet or you have the trappings or Forbes magazine said that you were, you know, the top 10 billionaires. Right here, at, even on his best day, this is maybe, maybe where folks like Donald Trump feel okay. It's a level where mainstream culture operates. But remember, things go away, right? Your jet can crash, your comp the stock market can crash. If all of your sense of power and security and authority and control is based on an external source like how much money do I have in the stock market or do I get to drive a fancy car everybody likes and that stuff goes away, where are you left? That's why you got people jumping out of windows and the, the great stock market crash. It's, it was horrible. It's horrifying. But, you know, someone whose locus of authority is internalized would go, eh, we made more money. There's more where that came from. Right? As long as we have each other, we're, we are wealthy beyond measure. What did Jenny say? Absolutely. It's also like leaders who think they have power because people have given it to them. That's right. True leaders, and this is a message of the um, the Aries card in the Major Arcana of the Tarot, the Emperor card. That is the wise leader who understands that he is in service. I always uh, thought of that. To be honest, I'm a fan of Barack Obama. I liked his speeches, but quite often I heard him say that we are in service to the people to do the best job that we can. And to me, that was sort of an, you know, the sorts of things you see written about um, the, the, uh, the Aries card, the Emperor card. Unfortunately, people uh, assign their own value and their own power, their own sway, their own influence, often by what brand of clothes they wear or what their sneakers are. Um, I don't give a shit about any of that. I really don't. Another thing that's interesting, I've noticed that some people who are very innovative, very um, entrepreneur, to that sort of mad genius sort of level, like your, uh, I don't know, your Elon Musk's and your, th these these guys that are the, t the tippy top of these um, tech giants or whatever, and they tend to have like a uniform, like nope, all I wear is black turtlenecks and jeans, like Steve Jobs or whatever. Because honestly, that level of stuff, like fashion or whatever, who cares? I don't know anything about that. These are people who are very much rooted in airy stuff, and I, I can I can appreciate that. Anyway, so the next the next three levels, there's six stages of power, according to Jung, by the way. The next three levels require there to have been some sort of spiritual gnosis, some sort of eye-opening experience, a near-death experience, um, like a burning bush moment, right? Like my story from the last video where I'm questioning everything and, and suddenly deity is arresting the moment, right? To, to get my attention. Okay, so basically he, he flat out said some sort of an event or experience has to shift you out of a cultural norm and perception into spiritual gnosis, and that will help to redefine what power is for you. 
So the next one is, number four is power by reflection. True power is not something out there. It's not things. It's not relationships. It's not status symbols. Pa power is in here. It is who I am. It is what I stand for. It is my values. And that is where we really could all stand to be, right? A much better place to be. In order to have that be where you get your power, you first have to know who you are. You have to know what your values are. You have to know what you stand for, what is sacrosanct to you. I think when um, people experience some very difficult trauma where the heroes are, are, are required to emerge and to really make things happen, it requires, you know, we'll go, oh, so much self-sacrifice and so much, look how much they gave of themselves and all oh, the, you know, whatever. But honestly, I think that when you're that person, you don't even think about it that way anymore. You're like, no, we're just doing what we have to do because it's the right thing. There are things that are worth fighting for. Think about uh, Frodo and Sam as they went through Mordor. There are things in this world worth saving. And they suffered for it. But it was worth it to them as a character. I think about, um, I think about the end scene of Harry Potter series and the Deathly Hallows as a character example. The book, not necessarily the movie. Um, spoiler alert. There's this wand called the, the Deathly Hallow. The, the Elder Wand is, is a Deathly Hallow and it controls death. It had been Dumbledore's wand. It was the, the focus of the whole last book of them finding it. And it was supposed to make the bearer the most powerful person in the world. Coveted. Harry gets this. And what does he do? Well, in the book anyway, he uses it to repair his good old wand he got when he was 12. His, it works well enough. It suits me. I like it. It's comfortable. I don't need all this fancy business. But moreover, I don't think anybody else should be allowed to start a war and torture people to try to find this power. It's too much. And he cracks it and he throws it in. He throws it away. So that's, that to me is especially a power by reflections. Like it doesn't, all that stuff doesn't matter. It, who do we stand? Who are we? What do we stand for? Anyway. I wish more people lived there. The five, number five is power by our purpose. A clear attunement to sacred mission. Purpose for being alive. And this is a quote from the article. At this stage, we know what we are meant to do. We have a clarity of vision and a concrete goal that gives a compelling sense of direction and energy to our daily lives. Which is why when I was talking about the prerequisites for witchcraft training, I went on and on about just figuring out what your sacred mission is and start to put your energy there. A, a sense of gnosis will come. I think it typically it happens in that first Saturn return. You know, that happens around 2930. That happens every 29 and a half years in your life. You get another Saturn return if you're lucky enough to make it to your late 50s. You get another one if you're lucky enough to get to your mid 80s. But it does help us to define our mission and what we stand for. If you know what that is, if you have a shining mission of what that is, then everything else just makes more sense. It just falls into place. Um, it's funny in my life. I, I feel like sometimes I, I, I get there. I had a, a I had another come to goddess meet, meeting um, when I was in my Saturn return. And it was part of my uh, childbirth experience with my first child. And it lit my fires. It was the most, it was, it was just so important. I had a mission. I had a mission. And, and, it, and the mission of investing in spirit and realizing there was something more and, and finding it and nurturing it and nurturing my children and being a creator, that, that started then. And then it kicked off really in that fire year, the, the year where everything was stripped away. And suddenly I just had this burning purpose. And so everything has been so much easier since then. So finding your purpose, and mind you, I asked for it, right? Hey, I want to be that level. I want to do that. And then once you do that work and you stand on sacred ground and you announce to the cosmos and divinity everywhere that this is what I intend to do, please help me, show me the way. They will. 
they will. At least they did in my experience. You just gotta be willing to follow where the path leads. But anyway, to me it's worth it. Okay, the next stage, oh, one last quote from Power by Purpose. We live authentically as who we are and we work tireless, tirelessly to empower others. Ego really does take a whole different situation there. Um, and it's funny because people who aren't operating at that level will assume ulterior motives. It's like they're projecting their, their ulterior, what their ulterior motive would be. They're more selfish, more, what do I get out of this? What's my reward? kind of a thing um, onto other people like no one can be that what altruistic or whatever but it isn't altruism it's just your natural state of being you're like no look we're all in the soup together let's we're all in this together so so me helping someone else become empowered and get what they need is also helping me but it's not like oh well that's what i get out of it it's just this foregone conclusion so I don't know. I just think it's the way everybody should be. But quite often, something that just seems so whatever to me, like, oh, sure, okay. I might either get accused by, on one hand, of somehow trying to exploit or profit, or there's got to be an ulterior motive, and they can't figure out what it is, but God, by God, we'll figure it out eventually. There's some reason why they're doing that nice thing. It can't be for good reasons. And they're just so paranoid and fearful and... It's projecting. It's projecting their own bullshit shadows onto other people. Anyway, this is why um, folks like Jesus and Gandhi and Martin Luther King and um, I don't know all the really great thinkers and and philosophers, Joan of Arc. I don't know Susan B. Anthony, Galileo. I mean, I don't know. All I know is that there's a whole lot of people who were innovators and who were were warriors and they saw the world in a different way and they really put themselves out there to, to, to do the, to make change and be authentic. And they all got, you know, here comes the pitchforks and torches and crazy mob people. Oh, Pythagoras. That's another one. Paracelsus. Paracelsus was attacked by angry colleagues more than once. The first time they didn't quite kill him. And so they had to come back and finish the job. And then they were so angry. They kept moving his bones around. Poor guy. Anyway. Hey, Caleb. The, the sixth one, and I'll be honest, I'm not even sure the right way to pronounce this world, but the power of gestalt, 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 a level of sage or avatar, a Christ or a Buddha, perhaps the Sai Baba or Mother Mira. I don't know who those two people were. That was someone that was referenced by the person who wrote the article. But someone who's, who's attained a level of understanding that they're about to be, you know, bodhisattva level. They're about to bliss out as far as I'm concerned. But someone who's just really reached that stage of understanding their divinity within the interconnected cosmos where the rest of the barriers just fall away and they're able to appear so very miraculous and and um, like a miracle worker, that kind of thing. So I think that's what that, re that means. And isn't that supposed to be the point of evolution is where you start to understand all these things and the bullshit falls away? I would like to think it is. Anyway... So the whole internalizing the locus of control is about your personal sovereignty in the world and how you create your own world. Locus of authority was about, can you trust yourself? Like, can you say, no, I'm in charge of me. I know what I need. I can trust my, my processes of making a decision based on my intuition and my experience. And I don't have to depend on an outside source to tell me my way in the world. Or tell me who should I, how should I think or how should I believe or who should I pray to or how should I vote. You don't need anybody else to do that for you. That's an internalized locus of authority. And the, the recommendation by uh, Sue Mertens who wrote the, the articles that I was studying was very, um, was very uh, insistent that it takes a very long time of, of studying your dreams, of um, following your intuition, of meditation of um, really putting into practice a, a lifestyle of trusting your gut and then seeing how that works out. And if it doesn't work out just so, adapting and adjusting and so forth. 
It doesn't mean we never listen to outside input. It doesn't mean that we don't ask advice or go look something up. We're not, you know, we're not sociopaths. We can still ask for help. But in the end, we know we're the one that makes the decision. We don't need laws or churches to tell us the right way to act or to be, right? We know the right way on our own, and we follow that without anybody else telling us otherwise, right? I love this incense. I had to like some more. Plus, it makes it spooky. <laughs> anyway, so much, so much to think about there. But that's how we internalize that locus of authority is uh, through through the work we're doing, and what and and isn't that the most terrifying thing? You know, uh, witches are always renowned apparently for their being radically free thinkers, living living their own best life, and not really caring if it's apost. How do you say it? Ap aposty, apos. Heresy, or the living not according to the mainstream, well, so apostasy, I think is how you say that, I don't know, religion terms, heresy, I'm telling you, it's all this heresy of, of mine, and that's just what we do, right, we're radically free thinkers, we do our own thing, it's part and parcel of witchcraft, and I think people who are prone to have had the spiritual experiences that kicked them in a different relationship of power, right? Like, you know, we've had come to goddess experiences or that dream or that thing that affirmed that we have an interconnection. The veil drops for a moment and suddenly you're aware and then you can never go back to the old way of going, oh, well, I guess capitalism is the best idea. That was never a good idea. Oh, I think slavery. That sounds nice and safe. I think I'll just externalize my my security by allowing some cult religion or my job to enslave me or whatever. Nah. Anyway, I have rambled on enough. I'm sorry I haven't paid very close attention to what the comments were tonight. I guess I just got going. I'm sorry. How are y'all doing? Everybody good? I know I've been talking long enough. If there's any last uh, thoughts or comments anybody wanted to make or ask me a question or if I could clarify, hit me up. If I don't catch it now, I can answer um, comments later. The, the video does stay on the Facebook page with all the comments. And I can uh, go find those articles by Sue Mertens from the UnionCenter.org and link them in for you guys. That'd probably be nice. Um, and then, you know, if you have the ability and, and got something meaningful out of this WeChat and you'd like to help the store, um, I, we do take PayPal donations at orders at thesojo.com and we certainly appreciate that. Um, we still have t-shirts and other swag up on the teespring.com. For example, this groovy mug, Rainbow Pride mug, it says, Taking the path less traveled by and making all the difference at the Sojourner. We've also got one that says, Namaste stay away, with a Hand of Hamsa stop sign up there. And I've gotten some other suggestions. Um, Alan suggested that I make a, an apron design that says, Witching in the Kitchen. And I swear I want one. Maybe we're on the back of the t-shirt. It says, uh the four rules of witchcraft and list them out, you know? Maybe on the front it just says, witch on fire with like a funny little flamey cauldron or something. I don't know. Ah, <sighs> things to do. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I appreciate it. This is the uh, 12th of these chats. I had planned 13, which would make um, Tuesdays the last one because I thought we'd be out of lockdown in April. I think I will continue. I don't know what the schedule will be from there on, but I think maybe something for Beltane or maybe uh, maybe I can do a kind of once a week or on the moons or, or whatever. Uh, we'll think of something because this has been fun and who knows how long the, the weirdness will last, so I'd be happy. <laughs> Jenny to get an apron. Um, I... I'm going to put my best man on uh, that, those graphic designs and we'll see what he comes up with. That being my, my son. So we'll see. Oh, good. Okay. Well, I know that on um, May 4th, uh, the, the Sojo Coven is going to do a Zoom one. But maybe we can do it um, on May 1st, more the traditional day. So that that would give ideas also for, when you, for when, whenever you celebrate. So we'll see. I'll come up with a plan. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you coming. Um, Merry meet, Merry part, and Merry meet again. Namaste.
away safely in your homes until we're told we can come out and play again. Until then, blessed be.